If I had to describe this episode in one word, it would be majestic. From the opening funeral to the closing wedding, this episode was a powder keg waiting to explode, and explode it did. It's time to pick a side. But first, let's break down this episode and what made it so great. Oh, and we really need to discuss Aemond. That boy's gonna be a big deal. The opening of this episode struck a chord with me. It was so somber and majestic, wonderfully filmed and beautifully scored by Jawari. I need this House of the Dragon album ASAP. There were a couple of themes in this episode that I wanted to listen to straight after. I guess we'll have to wait three more weeks once the season ends, but I really don't want it to. This is probably the highlight of my week watching these episodes every Sunday. I'm going to be so sad when it ends. The funeral itself was filled with loads of character moments and reactions. Damon chuckling at the thinly veiled barbs by Corley's brother at the legitimacy of Rhaenyra's children. Everyone seemed shocked, but we as the audience have the advantage of camera angles and to see why Damon would be chuckling. It's either that or be outraged that Corley's brother would use this moment to take shots at Rhaenyra. He wasn't joking about salt running thick in the blood of the Valerians, because he really was a salty MFer. The series seemed to pick up on the underlying current too. Aegon still managed to shine as a real prick, and our number one boy Otto is back as the Hand of the King. I love how he adjusted his cloak as a little flex to the audience. Was anyone else dreading that the casket was going to break open or awkwardly get lodged when falling into the sea? I was getting vibes of Edgemere trying to shoot the funeral pyre and it going horribly wrong. I'm glad this went smoothly though. I really loved seeing the ceremony as it enriched the world, seeing the differences between cultures and houses. The Starks buried their kin in the crypts of Winterfell, the Valerians submerged theirs on the coast of Driftmark. It just makes me wish we had spent more time with Lena, as this would have been a more emotional moment for the audience. The Wake had more moments and really managed to show us where characters stand with one another without really saying a word. Rhaenys, for example, has no interest in Rhaenyra. She knows that Rey's sons are not Lena's, and she's very cold towards them. Look at how she greets her granddaughters. Jaceres kind of takes the hint to shove off. Corlys, on the other hand, is warm to Luke because although they are not biologically his grandsons, they are his by name, but we'll get into that a little later. Now this is a nitpick, but it's one I want to highlight because I thought it was an unforgivable use of a shot. And it's this one right here. This shot should not have been used because it was a one-off and seemed to have no real meaning behind it. Initially I thought it was supposed to insinuate someone looking at them through a looking glass of some sort. Realistically though, I think it was a shot used to break up a sequence and the lens that he had did not fully cover the sensor of the camera, so we get some heavy vignetting. I thought this was going to lead to some spying on Damon and Rhaenyra later on, but this is the only time this odd shot was used and it really jumped out to me and brought me out of the scene. Anyway, nitpick over because this was actually the only negative thing I had to say about this episode. Helena continues to say some weird stuff, this time she says, Hand turns the loom, spool of green, spool of black, dragons of flesh weaving dragons of thread. The greens refer to the targs of Alicent's line, the blacks the lineage of Rhaenyra's. She already said Aemond would close an eye to ride a dragon. You will have a dragon one day. You'll have to close an eye. Might not have been voluntarily, but it came true so to speak. There's a lot of power play happening in this wake between Daemon and Viserys and Rhaenyra and Daemon. Viserys is constantly looking over to his brother hoping they might talk and Daemon pretty much waits it out until his brother walks to him and tries to reconcile. Daemon refuses and his pride causes him to storm out. Otto notices Rhaenyra following Daemon, as he would. Did anyone else die inside when Viserys called Alison Aemer? I'm going to bed, Emma. Shall I see after Queen Alison, your place? Even Sir Harold caught that. The series sadly isn't long for the world. I know I keep saying it and he lasted for previous 10 years, but each time this man goes to Driftmark, he loses a piece of himself and this will probably take his mind. I just feel so sorry for him. He's trying his absolute best to keep his family together and he's barely holding on. Once he's gone, it's going to be absolute chaos, which makes for a fantastic TV show, of course, but there's tragic characters you would hope have happy endings. I swear Alison's gonna smother the guy, isn't she? <laughs> Rhaenyra and Daemon seem to be having this dance during the wake, both of them noticing one another, but waiting for the other to make a move. It took Damon storming off for them to have a moment on the beach. 
They have a rather honest conversation on the beach. Rhaenyra is basically catching the audience up on her life with Lainor and explained her fall for Sir Harwin. Damon is often honest in his talking, but here Rhaenyra feels free and this is certainly a contrast to that seduction in episode 4. Damon makes it abundantly clear that he believes Sir Harwin and Lionel Strong were killed by Alison or Otto, and it wasn't the curse of how and how. I'm shocked Rhaenyra was naive to believe that. The sex scene here is a lot more tender rather than lust-filled, though it seems the minds of these people are short considering they just lost loved ones, but neither of them seem overly troubled or upset about it. Maybe it's just finding comfort in one another's arms and them being a little harsh. It does seem like Damon's over his impotence problems with Rhaenyra. When Rhaenyra woke up and Damon wasn't there, I thought he had banged and dashed, but glad he was just looking out of the open sea and, and Aemon on Vagar. Watching this play out, I was feeling nervous Aemon was going to stumble upon them, but instead he comes across Vagar, and it's stunning. The sheer scale of this dragon is eye-opening, and the way they shoot it with Aemon really having to climb up the netting just shows how much bigger Vagar is than most dragons we've seen prior. It also showed us how nerve-wracking it must be to claim a dragon. One false move, or if the dragon doesn't think you're worthy, then you're toast. The flight was a lot of fun and the little details of the birds almost pelting into Aemond was a cute touch. The music as well harkened back to Daenerys' various themes of the dragon, especially the drum beats reminded me of when she says Dracarys for the first time to free the Unsullied. Hopefully, Aemond gets a proper fit in harness to ride Vagar in future, but seeing the joy and how much it means to Aemond to fly the dragon was nice. The dragon riding shots seemed a little bit more improved here, maybe it was easier to blend the shots with the darker look. Hopefully they can keep this quality for future dragon back riding scenes. Now we come to the big daddy scene, and that was the meeting in the hall in regards to the attack on Aemond. This scene was agonizingly tense and had me on the edge of my seat throughout. It was also filled with a couple of hilarious Cole moments. Entertaining his young squire's adventure. The king is furious and he's taking zero shit here and decrees that anyone who questions the legitimacy of Rhaenyra's children will have their tongue ripped out and he says this specifically to Alicent. It's a moment that I think if Viserys had more of he would have garnered more respect throughout his reign. It was a kingly moment, he has authority and he shows it again further when Alicent orders Kristen to bring her the Eye of Lucerys. Even Cole won't go against the king's orders and Alicent sees the limits of her powers. Alicent lunges at Rhaenyra with the magic dagger and they share a moment and all our theories on why Alicent detests Rhaenyra comes true and she can't handle the truth and nor can she handle losing so she draws first blood by cutting Rhaenyra. I did like the small moment where Alicent says, what have I done but what is expected of me? And it cuts to Rhaenyra looking at the dagger with that awesome shot of the background of fire. A reminder to Rhaenyra that's what's expected of her, even if nobody else knows, her legacy is to carry that dagger and to best fulfil the prophecy of the prince that was promised, and to keep the realm safe. That very prophecy is actually a threat to her life as well. I also found it funny that no one else intervened, is it because of the high standing of both these ladies that nobody wanted to interfere? Even Sir Harold did not separate them. Eventually everything calms down but the damage is done. Word of this gets out and it will be because there's no way of hiding it thanks to Aemon's missing guy. Battle lines are drawn, the Greens, which is Alicent, her children, the Hightowers and Larry Strung, and the Blacks, which is Rhaenyra, her children, Daemon and the Valerians. Hello, my name's Liam, a fellow YouTuber and long-term friend of Tom's. Uh, I'm going to be taking over this bit for him because his voice has betrayed him, and even though he sounds like a cool 80s action hero, apparently it hurts when he talks. So, on with the script. I'll be breaking down the rest of these moments via sides. First up will be the Blacks, which encompass Rhaenyra, Daemon, and the Valerians. When Rhaenyra thought of the plan of getting rid of Laenor, my heart sank. Early on, Rhaenyra describes Laenor as being useless, and perhaps losing his sister would cause him to further spiral, which is understandable. When she needs strength most, he will be faltering. Laenor had a rough episode, dealing with the death of his twin sister, but he seemed to come out the other end ready to step up. Put aside his relationship with Sakal and help teach and train his sons. I felt renewed optimism for it all, until Rhaenyra tells Daemon they need to join together in perhaps the most unsexiest of marriage proposals I've ever heard. I need you, uncle. This means they need Laenor out of the picture and instantly. I thought, 
How would audiences take this? Would this cause them to shift from Rhaenyra's side? This objectively is a horrible thing to do, and Laenor is a good man. Ray said as much earlier in the episode. What Alicent committed in the previous episode with Sir Harwin and Lionel, you could chalk up to manslaughter. It was inadvertent. Rhaenyra here is talking murder. It's premeditated. Be sure to let Tom know in the comments below if this would have pushed you away from Rhaenyra's side. He really does love discussions on moments like this. For the end of the episode, the writers hit the fast forward button, as we get what would probably be a decent chunk of an episode into cut, as Damon and Rhaenyra get married in a private ceremony. I'm unsure how valid or accepted by the public this will be. Usually this is a huge occasion, but even the king isn't present here, and he would usually have a say in such matters, so expect some fallout here. And Leonor is removed from the board, to go live a quiet life abroad in Essos with a bag of gold. He gets his freedom, at the cost of some poor bugger who pays the price at the end, so, you know, sucks for that guy. The poor Valarions really take a hit here. Not only have they lost a daughter, but a son as well. This one in an embarrassing fashion, as the death of Leonor happens in Corliss' own hall, a place that should be a symbol of his power and safe haven. There's the beginning of cracks between Corliss and his wife, Rhaenerys as she calls him out for his first for power. Rhaenerys wants Lyanna's daughters named as heirs to Driftmark. This would be like dropping a nuclear bomb on the Targaryens if she did this, because they would have to explain why they are changing the line of succession, and this would put further doubt on the heritage of Rhaenyra's children. This ends up happening later anyway, but not due to changing the heirs to Driftmark. What's fascinating is Rhaenyra's coldness to Jace and Luke, whilst Corlys is accepting of the boys. To him, it's not the blood, it's the name, and they bear his name. That's what's important to him. History does not remember blood. It remembers names. He's not wrong either. If you've read the books or know the history of Westeros, it's predominantly the names of people we remember. That's what's written down. It's not like they have photographs of these heroes from the past. This is, however, ironic considering the show makes a big deal of bloodlines in its opening credits. Now we shift over to the Greens, which consists of Alicent and the Hightowers. Our main man Otto is back, and he's lurking in the shadows, watching everyone's moves and keeping a low profile. Our main man Damon's having none of it, though. No matter how fat the leech grows, it always wants for another meal. You can tell he's thinking Aegon's going to be a screw-up, and he would probably prefer Aemond being the eldest son. Now, his scene with Alicent was golden, he obviously missed the feast in episode 5, so wouldn't have seen Alicent wearing the green dress as a beacon. But instead of chastising Alicent, he's impressed. He needed to see that spark, he needed to see that fire in her. It's the most proud he's ever been of Alicent, because she's ready to play the game. I love the way Otto licks his lips at gaining Vagar to their side, and neither Alicent or Otto are speaking in riddles. It's pretty transparent, which shows a growing strength of their relationship. Alicent's also willing to start playing more dirty. At the beginning of the episode, she shuns Laris, preferring to leave him in the background without even acknowledging him. He's not as honourable as she would prefer. After seeing how paralysed Kristen was in being ordered to cut out Luke's eye, though... Stay your hand! No, you were sworn to me! As your protector, my queen. It causes her to assess her options, and she realised she needs someone willing to get their hands dirty and play the game some of these more honourable knights prefer not to. Will this be her downfall? Who knows. But she's certainly willing to test her limits now, and the gloves are off. And now for the bit that's not in Tom's script, but, you know, I hope he keeps in anyway. If I could name one YouTuber who I think deserves your sub, it's, it's Tom. If you're watching this right now and you haven't subscribed, why the hell not? His work ethic is absolutely insane. Look at his subs, this is not his full-time job and he's trying his best to crank these videos out on a weekly basis as quick as he can. His passion for storytelling is absolutely immense. You know, he's not a writer himself, he just loves stories and discussing the ins and outs of them. And hands down, he's honestly one of the nicest guys I know. So please, if you are watching this, if you're not subscribed, please just hit that subscribe button. It literally takes a few seconds. Thanks guys.
I highlighted Eamon for a reason in this intro. I think he's going to be one of the big players going forward, but also the most human. I think he'll get a bit of a bum rap for his fight with the Valarians in the cave, but let's take a closer look at him throughout this episode. Eamon seems to be wise beyond his years. He's the type of prince you would want to inherit the throne as he understands his duty and respects the process. He's not trying to get drunk at a funeral like his brother. If anything, he's more of a victim. At the wake, he shares a moment with Jace. It's an unspoken look, but it's the only bit of sympathy Jace gets from anyone, and it's certainly a look of knowing about Jace's real dad being dead. He's also worthy enough to climb atop of Vagar, and when assessing the rumble in the cave, they attacked him first. He could have had a bit more tact about it, but he's probably high off the recent gain of power. Remember, we've been shown him being bullied when they presented him the Pink Dread. Is this a common occurrence in King's Landing? I know Lena's daughters wouldn't have been in on that, but he's just dishing out what he's been receiving. Now, he certainly does escalate things, but Jace pulled a freaking knife on the boy. Let's not forget that. Look, Aemond has the biggest dragon from the looks of it. If you look at the kids attacking him, it took three or four of them to take him out. Maybe we're foreshadowing how many it might take to bring him and his dragon down if they go to war. I certainly wouldn't want to be Luke who took his eye. <laughs> Now, look at how Aemon gathers himself in the hall. He could have ratted on his mother, which may have had great consequences for Alicent. Would Viserys have had Alicent's tongue out? Would he have removed her from the small council? Who knows? But he was smart enough to pass the buck onto his brother Aegon, who in true Aegon fashion has a look of bewilderment. It was Aemon who was able to de-escalate the confrontation in the hall by saying it was a worthy trade. For now. He certainly gained Otto's respect for that, and it put him on a level to take seriously. Because if this is how he acts at 12 or 14, imagine an older version of him with more years and wisdom behind him. He's going to be a formidable foe. And is Kristen Cole going to give that dagger back to Viserys? Is that how it becomes lost in time? Hmm. <laughs> 